Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I'm back with some more Esoterica. Today we are beginning a new work. This is The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary by Carl Eckhart Hausen. It is an uh, esoteric text. We will be reading aloud and discussing as we go along the various points that are brought to light by the, the text. Today is going to be the groundwork video. It will be laying out the introduction and who this guy is in general. We are going to take what is included with the works and not try to go to any external sources for this. We're just going to read the introduction today and the forward. Um, before we begin, however, if you are unfamiliar with me, any of my unconventional beliefs, or if at any point in time you get a little bit lost in the sauce and do not understand the terminology, there will be several playlists linked in the corner above in the box down below, along with the original source material so that you can get a better understanding of who I am and why I do what I do and why I stand where I stand. A particular note again today is almost certainly going to be the unconventional Bible study where I have 161 videos where I detailed my leaving the Christian faith um, and the infinite integrations playlist which is also included where I talk about the more esoteric and spiritual things according to my understanding of them. With that being said, we are going to dive into The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary by Carl Eckhart Hausen. This was reprinted in 1909. Carl von Eckhart Hausen, 1752 to 1803, was an 18th century German mystic who wrote extensively upon esoteric topics. This work, The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, is Christian mysticism veiled in hermetic code. We have done Hermes Trismegistus. Several of his works are in a separate playlist. It is part of the Ancient Lore playlist, which will be included in the links above. <clears throat> Eckhart Hausen was briefly a member of the Bavarian Illuminati, but left for spiritual reasons. He cryptically mentions a society of the elect, which has existed from the very beginning of time, the invisible celestial church. He predicted that it is the society whose members form a theocratic republic, which one day will be the regent mother of the whole world. This book later influenced the Order of the Golden Dawn and, most notably, Aleister Crowley by J.B. Hare. And we're going to dive into the introduction <clears throat> for a further explanation. This is probably going to be a bit shorter video than I normally do. Right, I try to keep them around an hour, but I don't want to dive into the text in the introduction video. So, Apart from The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, Eckhart Hausen is a name only to the Christian transcendentalist of England. He wrote much, and at his period and in his place, he exercised some considerable influence. But his other works are practically unknown among us. While in Germany, the majority, at least, seems forgotten, even among the special class to which some of them might be assumed to appeal. The cloud upon the sanctuary has, I believe, always remained in the memory of a few, and is destined still to survive, for it carries with it a message of very deep significance to all those who look beneath the body of religious doctrine for one principle of life which energizes the whole organism. <clears throat> This translation has offered it for the first time to English readers, and it appears here upon the third phase of its existence. It originally appeared originally in the pages of The Unknown World, a magazine devoted to the deeper understanding of philosophical and mystical religion, and it was afterwards republished in volume form, of which addition this is a new issue. It has attracted very considerable attention and deserved it. It has been, has even been translated into French under the auspices of the late Countess of Caithness for the pages of Leore. These few words of bibliography are not unnecessary because they establish the fact that there has been some little sentiment of interest working within a restricted circle, as one may hope, towards a more general diffusion of knowledge of a document which is at once suggestive from the literary standpoint and profoundly moving from other and higher considerations. It encourages me 
to think that many persons who know and appreciate it now or may come under its influence in the future will learn with pleasure the little that I can tell them of its author. The counselor at Carthausen and of certain other books not of his writing, which, as I think, connect therewith, and the study of which may help us to understand its message. Perhaps the most interesting thing that I can say at the beginning concerning Eckhart Hausen is that he connects with that group of theosophists of which Lavater was so important a figure. The Baron Kirchberger, an accomplished and interesting recorder, and Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, a correspondent in France, and a certain source of leading. In his letters to St. Martin, Kirchberger says that Eric Eckhart Hausen, with whom he was in frequent communication, was a man of immense reading and wonderful fertility. He recorded him, as in other respects, as an extraordinary personage, whatever way providence may have led him. It would appear that at this period, namely in 1795, Eckhart Hausen was looking for and obtaining his chief light from the mystical study of numbers, but was also, to use the veiled and cautious language of the correspondence, in enjoyment of a more direct favors. St. Martin confesses on his own part that he was more interested in Eckhart Hausen than he could express. Kirchberger must have held him in even higher estimation and undertook a journey to the Swiss frontier, actually for the purpose of receiving from him the personal communication of the lost word. (laughs) But the illness of the proposed communicator frustrated this project. The point is important because it establishes the pretensions of Eckhart Houston. As to the Counselor of Bern, so to us, he comes speaking with authority and whatever may be our opinion as to the kind of sacramentalism or economy which was conveyed in a proposal to communicate the incommunicable name, there are some of us who know, at least within certain limits, that the little book which I am here introducing is not one of vain pretension. Side note, in case you don't know, I have that word. I can't give it out, but I do know what he's talking about. St. Martin acknowledges that part of the numerical system of Eric Eckhart Hausen was in astonishing agreement with things that he had learned long ago in his own school of initiation, that of Martinez de Pasquale. Altogether, the French mystic had formed the best opinion possible of his German brother, and his Swiss correspondent further tells us that Eckhart Hausen, although a courtier, walked in the narrow way of the inner life. In a letter to Kirchberger dated March 19, 1795, Eckhart Hausen bears witness to his own personal experience and instructions received from above. His consciousness of a higher presence, the answers which he had received, and the visions, with the steps by which he had advanced even to the attainment of what he terms the law in its fullness. I have thought it well to give these data derived from private correspondence, the publication of which was never designed or expected at the time, because they constitute a sketch of Eckhart Hausen taken to some extent unawares, when there could be the least reason to suppose that he was adopting an attitude. <clears throat> Let us now compare the very strong claim with which they incorporate with that of the cloud upon the sanctuary itself. And the little analysis which I shall give here will, I think, be otherwise serviceable to readers as a summary of the chief purport of the work. It is possible, by seeking inwardly, to approach the essential wisdom. And this wisdom is Jesus Christ, who is also the essence of love within us. I disagree wholeheartedly with that. The truth of this statement can be experimentally proved by anyone the condition of the experience being the awakening within us of a spiritual faculty cognizing spiritual objects as objectively and naturally as the outward senses perceive natural phenomena. Just to expound upon that, if you don't want to go through the Bible study, God is, Jesus was. That is a very big distinction. I believe that all things come from God, including essential wisdom, not Jesus Christ. 
He was an adept at best, an initiate most likely, possibly a master, but he taught things as recorded that are in contradiction to life in its general sense. I know that that is going to step on some toes, but there is a reason there are 161 videos that detail the falling away and why it happened. It is not an arbitrary decision. It is not uh, me harboring resentment or trying to bring disruption or anything of that nature. I am striving to bring as many people as I possibly can to a knowing of the Creator. The Creator in and of Himself is plenty sufficient without any intermediary being necessary. And there was never any need for anything to die for you to be forgiven from sin. The only thing that had to die for you to be forgiven from sin was your sin. That is a fundamental, universal fact. It's not my opinion. Jesus told you that, and yet they built a whole religion around him. The truth of this statement can be experimentally proved by anyone, the condition of the experience being the awakening within us of a spiritual faculty cognizing spiritual objects as objectively and naturally as the outward senses perceive natural phenomena. This organ is the intuitive sense of the transcendental world, and its awakening, which is the highest object of religion, takes place in three stages. Morally, by the way of inspiration, intellectually, by the way of illumination, and spiritually, by the way of revelation. The awakening of this organ is the lifting of the cloud from the sanctuary, enabling our hearts to become receptive of God, even in this world. The knowledge of these mysteries has always been preserved by an advanced school, illuminated inwardly by the Savior, and continued from the beginning of things to the present time. <clears throat> there is no proof of that. We can trace the Illuminati back to the 1600s, possibly to the 1500s, but after that point it is extremely murky. It is possible that there was a school in between the time of the fall of the Republic of Plato, until the creation of the European states as we know them. But it is not something by which we have proof. There is no indisputable proof. There is revelation. There is inspiration, right? Those things are there, but there is no firm foundation upon which to build. Were these practices in use? Almost certainly. But we do not have the, the records of it being used outside of a few select places, and those are somewhat suspect in many cases. There is reason to believe that there were schools of hermetic thought back in Egypt, way back before the time of Christ, before even Abraham walked the earth. There are great reasons to believe that this existed in Midian. There are reasons to believe it existed in Babylon. There are reasons to believe it existed in the Far East well excluded from any corruption by Jesus the Christ. I say that because it is important to understand. This knowledge is almost certainly ancient, but it is also not something that we have a firm understanding of, right? There are people out here trying to dispense this information. That is what this is doing too. Now, this guy... Uh, he believes that, he, or he, he reports, not believes, he reports that he was a member of the Illuminati and that he removed himself from that for reasons, right? Whether or not those reasons are explained, I don't know. We haven't got there yet. There is absolutely every reason to believe him at his word for the most part, right? Was he part of an order? Probably. If he's telling us about it, then probably so. We'll just take him at his word. Because I do believe that there are orders. There have been orders and there will be orders. Right? We see that in masonry. Masonry is not that old. We see that in the Rosicrucianism. We went through that. It's not that old. And so there are 
other orders scattered throughout time. Some of them lived a long time. Some of them did not live a long time. But they were all interested in the dispensing of this information. I am trying to shed light on information that I know. I have had direct revelation. I have had direct inspiration and illumination. I do know a little bit more than some other people. I am not part of any clubs, so I cannot tell you for a fact that yes, this club exists. I cannot tell you for a fact that no, this club does not exist. I am not privy to that. In the same way that I am not privy to the inner workings of Masons, right? I can take what they have reported. We went through Manly Hall's The Greatest Secret, uh, the secret Teachings of All Ages, and there's a lot of Masonry involved in that. I do not purport to be an expert on Masonry. I can only take the things that have been reported and expound upon them. To my understanding of what has been revealed so far to me through these various studies, the Masons do not believe in the things in which they do. That is a major component in being able to do the things. Right? You can go through the ceremony and not imbue power in it. That is not wise at all. To not believe in the ceremonies in which you are participating is, at, at best, not wise, at most, probably extremely foolhardy. If you do not believe in ceremonial magic, you should not be waving the knife around and casting circles. All of that is to say that there is very good probability that there have been secret societies... But I am not affected by them. I do not have any oaths to hold. I do not have any vows of secrecy except the things that God himself has not given me express permission to relay to you. Most of the things that we will discuss, I will try to be clear. If I have experienced it, I will say I know. If I haven't experienced it, I will say I think. There is a subtle distinction. I will try to remain clear on that as we go along. There probably is a club. There probably is several clubs. There are probably clubs within the clubs. It doesn't take everybody in a club to be corrupted. It just takes one person to recruit for a corrupted club, right? So if you are a Mason, chances are you are not involved in any of the other more sinister clubs. But you could be. It does not exclude you from them by a long shot. I do not blame the Masons for anything in particular. The same way that I don't blame the Illuminati for it, because <clears throat> we don't have them claiming the things. There can be nefarious actors within whichever group, and that, from my understanding so far, from the brief description, was why he left. Because he was not aligned in the proper way. The knowledge of these mysteries has always been preserved by an advanced school, illuminated inwardly by the Savior and continued from the beginning of things to the present time. This community is the invisible celestial church, founded immediately after the fall and receiving a first-hand revelation for the raising of humanity. If that was true, if that was true, it would be the predominating force. It is not. But the weakness of men, as they multiplied, necessitated an external society, namely the outward church, which, in the course of time, became separated from the inner church, also through human weakness. The external church was originally consecrated in Abraham, but received its highest perfection in the mystery of Jesus Christ. The interior church is invisible and yet governs all. It is perpetuated in silence, but in real activity, and united the science of the temple and the ancient alliance with the spirit of the Savior, or of the interior alliance. This community of light is the reunion of all those capable of receiving light, and is known as the communion of saints. It possesses its school, its chair, its doctor, and a rule for students, with forms and objects of study, and in short, a method by which they study, together with degrees for successful development to higher altitudes. We must not, however, 
regarded as a secret society, meeting at certain times, choosing its elders and members, and united by special objects. For even the chief does not invariably know all of the members, and those who are ripe are joined to the general members when they thought least likely, and a point of which they knew nothing. The society forms a theocratic republic, which one day will be the regent mother of the whole world. Its members are exactly acquainted with the innermost of religions and of the holy mysteries, but these treasures are concealed in so simple a manner that they baffle unqualified research. If there were a secret society, it would definitely not want to be known as one, right? But taking that granted that there are secret societies, and we do know that there are, there can be a nefarious society. There can be a brotherhood of skull and bones. There could be a brotherhood of other things. I don't know. I'm not a member. But... If they were to form a theocratic republic, which definitely was a thing then, right? Maybe not as much now, but then for sure. And in the Bible, <laughs> there was a theocratic republic in the Bible too. You should go back and check that out. Kings and Chronicles will help you. But if it wants to be the regent mother of the whole world, that might be a problem, <laughs> right? God is, and he is beyond gender, so he is neither father nor mother, but we refer to him as father, and that's whatever. You can refer to him as mother, and that is fine. But to be the regent mother means to be the controlling factor, the controlling generator, and that's probably going to be a problem. That means control. That means less free will, more interdiction by those who have the knowledge, and that's a problem. <clears throat> Part of why... I do this here is to befuddle the attempts of these clubs. I do believe that they're out there. I don't know them to name them. And Illuminati is as good a name as any. But there could be an, an association that is entirely aligned for the betterment of mankind called that. So it's whatever. Regent mother implies control, right? The nurturing of the mother is controlling for the child. Regent implies control. That is what the word means. In control of for someone else. Of the whole world is a big one. right? Now, I'm going to say this because I am honest about these things and we have talked about it before. I am doing that. I have taken control of everything and everyone's timeline who is not actively controlling their own. If you have chosen to choose one of these clubs, you're not in my timeline group. If you are actively working against the powers of betterment for all mankind, you're not in my timeline group. I am here for the ignorant who do not know and those who are unwilling to accept for themselves the responsibility. In large part, if you are part of the control system that is Christianity, you are also not aligned. You can be, but most likely you are not. Christianity is not aligned for the betterment of all mankind. That is a problem for some people, and I understand that. And once again, I refer you to the unconventional Bible study. Its members are exactly acquainted with the innermost of religions and of the holy mysteries, but these treasures are concealed in so simple a manner that they baffle unqualified research. I am attempting to unconceal these treasures, right? I am acquainted with the innermost of religions. That is not to say that I am an example in every religion or an expert in every religion. But I do understand the fundamentals of almost all of them. I have at least familiarized myself with the basic tenets and precepts of most of them. It is almost impossible to have a knowledge of all of them. There are a great deal of religions out there. But most of the major ones for sure, but even most of the minor ones I have some understanding of. They all seem to be overarching associated with the same thing, right? The betterment of humanity. Even Christianity. But Christianity limits you, right? Jesus told you these things that I can do, you can do, and more. And Christianity tells you that you can do these things through Jesus. 
That is two completely separate statements. One was made by Jesus. One was made by an apostle. One you should probably listen to. One you should probably not. Christianity is not formed on the one that Jesus told you. Where are the faith healers? The ones that are actually affecting faithful healing. Where are they at? You got plenty of prosperity gospels. Where's the healers? They're not out there. You, there's plenty of charlatans running around, but there are nobody out there actually doing it, right? That is because of the limitations placed by the control system, which is Christianity in all its myriad of forms. And they all have a slightly different one. Like, if you're Baptist, you can't drink, but if you're Methodist, it's okay. Or Episcopalian, right? Some of them say that it's not okay to have gay marriage, and some of them say that it is. Some of them say that you have to be fully immersed in water in order to be saved. Other ones say that it's okay to sprinkle a baby and they're good for the rest of their life. None of them are correct. But these treasures are concealed in so simple a manner that they baffle unqualified research. This doctrine of the interior church must be interpreted by everyone after his own lights. That is true. It is presented by Eckhart Hausen as one having full knowledge and ambassadorial powers, as one speaking from the center. That is what I am doing as well. I claim that. My purpose is solely to show that he was sincere, and this sincerity furnishes us with one more proof, out of many which are to be derived from other and independent sources, that there is a great experiment possible, and that some have performed it. The sincerity of which I speak is, I think, illustrated by his life, which I will now summarize briefly. I have affected change in my own life. If you are unfamiliar with that, this is the first video you run across. I have healed myself. It is through the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Don't get that messed up. But he has allowed me to use the energies of creation to heal myself in very real ways. The fact that I can talk to you in this tone of voice is a direct result from that. I have performed an experiment. Whether it's the same one he's talking about, I don't know. But other people have done it throughout history, and I do not know that they have conveyed that accurately. Why we are doing this particular study is because it says that he is an ex-Illuminati member. Right, let's pull it up. I got, it should still be up here. A cloud upon the sanctuary right here. A Christian mystic who quit the Illuminati describes the process of enlightenment in hermetic language. I am trying to help clarify this language. To show in modern vernacular the things that they talk about. Sometimes it is clear, sometimes it is not. I am trying to clarify. Because I have had an experience in this experiment. I have had results. For myself, I don't claim to have healed other people, although that is definitely something that might have happened. I can affect people's emotions in a very direct way. I can pull things from you and ground them for you with consent. And there are some things that I have affected outside of myself, but for the most part, it is experimental within myself. It is experiential, which means that I can't give it to you. I can relay it to you. I am here to tell you, not to convince you. So while it may seem that I hammer some points a little bit harder, it's not out of trying to convince you. It is trying to ensure that I am conveying the information in a multiple, in many different ways, so that it can hit each person a little bit different and you might find the way that hits you in the way that you need to be hit, not physically. All right. <clears throat> Carl von Eckhart Hausen was born on June 28, 1752, at the castle of Heimhausen in Bavaria, and was the natural son of Count Karl of Hambenhausen and Marie Anne Eckert, the daughter of the overseer of the estates. His mother died in giving birth to him, and he appears to have been the subject of the most solicitous affection on the part of his father, being educated with the utmost pains. However, from the earliest years, his illegitimacy is said to have filled him with perpetual melancholy and an inclination to retire from the world. 
choosing to be a victim, characteristics which at the same time endeared him to his family and friends. Through all his life he remained more or less, less or more, a prey to the painful consequences of his original disqualification. He was destined, notwithstanding, to a career of some public importance. His first education was received at the College of Munich, and he afterwards proceeded to Ingolstadt for the study of philosophy and law, which he pursued with marked success. His university course at an end, his father procured him the title of Aulic Counselor, and in 1780 he was appointed censor of the library at Munich. This, in spite of the rectitude and goodness which characterized him, made him many enemies. But the favor of the elector, Carl, Carl Theodore, sustained him against all combinations. In 1784, he was nominated Keeper of the Archives of the Electoral House, an appointment said to have been conferred upon him through the desire of the elector to keep him near his person. He published in all some 69 works, embracing many classes of literature, including science, the fine arts, the drama, politics, religion, history, and, in particular, certain contributions of great merit to the occult sciences. As already indicated, the majority of these are now forgotten, though some of his plays seem to have been successful in their day. The Prejudice of Birth, in particular, his first published drama, is described as abounding in felicitous situations and interest. He even attempted a comedy, and this also received considerable approbation. Only one of his books, under the title God is the Purest Love, commanded wide popularity. Sixty editions are said to have been published in Germany, and it was translated into most languages of Europe, as well as into Latin. It is a small collection of Catholic prayers and meditations on the fear of God, the love of God, the elevation of man's sentiments towards his Creator, the knowledge of the Eternal, etc. There are also devotional exercises for use at Mass, before or after confession and at Communion with acts of penance and adoration to the Blessed Virgin. In a word, I fail to see wherein or how far it differs from the innumerable manuals of piety which have been produced during the last two or three centuries for the use of the Catholic laity. I believe, however, that it still circulates in Germany, and perhaps even in France. It is said to have a wonderful charm, though its intense mysticism is also stated to have puzzled some of its admirers. It has, indeed, been described as speaking the language and expressing the soul of Fenelon, Eckharthausen, however, as already indicated, wrote other and very different books, some on magic and some on the properties of numbers, and he is even accredited with a certain knowledge of alchemy. Finally, he was the author of The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, though the biographers to whom I am indebted almost for the words of this notice, have scarcely mentioned this last and crowning production of his intellectual life. In his private capacity, he was exceedingly amiable and charitable, devoting every month the result of his economies to the poor, and his whole time to the practice of virtue, so he was not balanced. He was married three times and left several children, definitely not balanced. He died on May 13, 1813, after a painful illness. The monographs of his period mentioned him as one of the best writers of Bavaria. There are two matters to which, before concluding, I wish to draw attention briefly, and as regards the first in a very particular manner. The point of view from which the cloud upon the sanctuary should be regarded is important from the claim from which it makes. What is this inner church of which Eckhart Hausen speaks is a question which readers must answer for themselves according to their best direction. One thing which it is not has been indicated by Eckhart Hausen himself. It is not any corporate body existing merely within the church and controlling and leading it from a specific local center. This possibility being negatived by the best of all authority on the subject, 
I should like on my own responsibility to negative also its most direct and clearest antithesis. It does not answer to the collective mind, or oversoul, of the most advanced members of the visible church, nor is it the consensus ominum sanctorum, which, according to the old church maxim, is sensus spiritus sancti. Despite the absence of all corporate bonds, there is in the claim itself too direct a suggestion of conscious association occurring somehow in this present physical life. <clears throat> We must take the key which Eckhart Hausen himself offers, namely, that there is within all of us a dormant faculty, the awakening of which within gives us entrance, as it develops, into a new world of consciousness, which is one of the initial stages of that state which he, in common with all other mystics, term union with the divine. In that union, outside all formal sex, all formal sex, not sex, but sex, <laughs> and orthodox bonds of fellowship and veils and webs of symbolism, we shall form, or do form actually, a great congregation, the first fruits of immortality, and in virtue of the solidarity of humanity, and in virtue of the great doctrine of the communication of all things holy with all that seeks holiness, the above and below, this congregation is, in very truth, the leader of the visible church of faith, aspiration and struggle, the church triumphant over watching the church militant, and the channel through which the graces and the benedictions of the holy and glorious Zion are administered to the Zion which is on earth. This is some self-insertion. Eckhart Hausen was Catholic. Now, there is not a whole lot holy about the Catholic Church. There is idol worship. You don't have to believe that. It is true. You pray to Mary. You are praying to a person, not God. God is outside of the control systems. God is the overarching power which is. God is all things. God is me, God is you, and God is the space between me and you, and the space between the space between me and you. He is everything you can see and everything you cannot see. God is. That is the overarching church, the communion and unity that is the before and the after. It is affected in small measure by you here, but not really before you were here in your voluntary incorporation in 5D space, you were somewhere else. When you leave this voluntary incorporation in 5D space, you will return to somewhere else. That is the church that is being implied here. I say that with authority because I understand it. This is one of those things that I know. There is, beyond here, the immortal. While you are here, you are meant to be part of the mortal. You can get a small measure of that immortal here. But it doesn't make you immortal. It doesn't, it can improve your health. So I don't want to say it doesn't do that, but it is not an automatic thing for it even to do that. You can live and not be correct. Right? You can be close to correct and not correct. I don't know that any of us will ever be fully correct, myself absolutely included in that. But I do feel like I am a little bit closer to it than other people are. I have had contact with the Eternal. Right, I was visited by an angel at one point and it was told me that I would spread the word of God before I even was a Christian. I was taken out of my body in a spiritual existence, and I was initiated into the order of Melchizedek, which appears to mean that I am a dispenser of information. I have had direct experiential use of the powers of creation. We will almost certainly get into deeper understandings of that, but they are contained in the Infinite Integrations playlist and in several places in the ancient lore and the Esoterica playlist. There are forces that you can use to affect change in your life. That is the church. 
all of the rest of them, the ones that are visible churches of faith, that is the control systems. That is man attempting to, attributing the best possible intentions here, man attempting to convey the infinite to you in the mortal form. To give you a framework by which to live your life in a way that you might obtain that. But here's the kicker. No matter what you do here, you are going to return to God. There is no hell. I don't say that lightly, but it is something that I stand on fairly firmly. There is zero references to hell in the Old Testament at all. We went through in painstaking detail in the Unconventional Bible Study, and we showed that. Even in the time of Jesus, the condemnation to hell was a later addition. Jesus did not necessarily tell you that you would be condemned to hell. He told you that you could seek the Father, but he didn't tell you that you were going to hell. That came after his death by some people that never even met him. And so, while I know that this is stepping on toes, this clarification is important and it is part of why we do it here in the groundwork and not in the work itself. The control systems can give you structure. They are useful for some people. Not everybody who watches my videos are going to do the things that I say. That is perfectly fine. If you are happy in your religious practice, be blessed in it. I am not trying to convince you to leave it. I am telling you that there is more to it. That almost certainly, whatever it is you believe, whatever particular religion it is that you believe, it is limiting the powers of God in a very real way. And it is limiting the powers of you in a very real way. There can be justifications for that at various points in time. But I do believe that we are past the need for any of those. We have accumulated the knowledge that would allow us to seek God first himself. And so that is why I believe that it has been revealed to me that you don't have to go through all of these intermediaries. You don't have to pray to Mary. You don't have to pray to Jesus. You don't have to pray to Muhammad. You don't have to pray to Buddha. I know they don't really pray to Buddha or even Muhammad, but you get what I'm saying here. Finding and following God is the way. That is the one true church. This self-insertion here of the church triumphant over watching the church militant is not it. That is a self-insertion. That is somebody who is a Christian seeking to insert into something else Christianity. That is self-insertion. I make references to that all of the time because it happens all of the time. All of the time. We see it repeatedly. Not just with Christianity, but with other things too. People inserting things that are not necessarily necessary. All right, let's get to the second point and see about wrapping this up. <clears throat> the second point concerns certain books which I have promised to mention as connecting with the claim of Eckhart Housen and perhaps in some measure assisting us to get in touch with that claim. Unfortunately, in this restricted notice, I can do little more than to name them. The first is The Mystery of the Cross, originally published in 1732 anonymously in the French language, but evidently written by a foreigner. It is a profound and beautiful work which, unknown to the world at large, has, in private, if I may so speak, influenced many to their advancement and to the deeper understanding and fruition of the hidden truth. Y'all remind me to look that up, please. I will forget even this quick. Like, I'll get out of this and I will go to cut this video up and it will slip my mind to come back and see what that reference is. Y'all remind me, please. I want to read these works, right? I want to read the works that are saying these things so that we can talk about those, right? I could have jumped into another story of Jesus, right? I almost did. This seems to be a better explanation of how to work with the powers. That's where I'm really wanting to find the, the clarification for people. 
Strongly embedded in this book will be found several of the governing ideas and aspirations of schools of mystic thought which became illustrious in later years. I may add that I am acquainted with the existence of a translation made many years ago, but still remaining in manuscript. The next books, which I would note, come at first sight a little strangely in the professed connection, but they are nonetheless in they enter nonetheless into the series. They are two dramatic poems by the German poet Werner, Werner, namely the Templars in Cyprus and the Brothers of the Cross. Again, remind me, please. They are the work of a man who was intimately acquainted with the occult movement of the, his period, that of the French Revolution, and a participant therein. After all his experience, he carried his great genius and exceptional knowledge into the fold of the Latin church and became a priest. His two plays convey many moving suggestions of a guiding but unknown hand leading the Christian church. The next book is of Russian origin, but it was translated into French and published in Paris in 1801. Of this translation, a reprint was issued recently at Lyons. It is entitled, Some Characteristics of the Interior Church. It connects the point of view, which is met with in The Mystery of the Cross, with that of Eckhart Hausen, and is interesting on account of its origin, and also for certain Martinistic associations, but it is less suggestive and less profound. Finally, there is a very remarkable and, I may add, a very rare series of works published at Berleburg, in the province of Westphalia, in seven volumes, dated 1738. It is entitled, New Spiritual Discourses on Various Matters of the Interior Life and the Doctrines of the Christian Religion, or Testimony of a Child of Truth Concerning the Ways of the Spirit. These discourses occupy two vo three volumes. Two others contain a commentary on the Apocalypse, the sixth volume is a literal and mystical explanation of the epistle to the Romans, with some supplementary papers and a catechism of the science of Christian religion. The seventh volume is another commentary, verse for verse, on the first three chapters of Genesis. The collection as a whole may perhaps be best described as an appeal from external creeds with their differences, their arguments and their justifications, to the witness of the heart itself. It is an appeal, also, to the mystical doctors of the church, and it cites many of the great mystics from Toulé and Reisburg to Engelbrecht, Antoinette de Bourgeonon, and Madame de Goyon. The discourses on the union of the Church of Christ and the spiritual union of the children of God, as also on a new church, in the second volume, will be found very interesting to students of Eckhart Hausen. I hope I can find these volumes too. There are also extraordinary analogies with St. Martin, Eckhart Hausen, and the Mystery of the Cross to be found in the third volume. And having regard to the proximity of the date of publication to that of the last work, I incline to the opinion that there may have been some connection also in the authorship. When all these works have been studied, not in the letter but in the spirit, along with the cloud upon the sanctuary, the spiritual truths which Eckhart Hausen has to some extent veiled, and his motives for doing so, will not be beyond discernment, nor the line of his experiences in all cases beyond pursuit. I should add that, so far as I can trace, Eckhart Hausen always remained in loyal communication with the external church in which he was originally trained, and did not therefore regard apostasy and rebellion as among the first evidences of personal illumination. Perhaps, like one of the Eastern teachers, he thought that some things could be changed from within, and essentially without altering names and forms. A. E. White if you are unaware, A.E. White is who we have to credit for our current tarot. Uh, he, in accordance with an, uh, an artist, created them. And the, we have in the Esoterica playlist the tarot explained as the journey of enlightenment. And this probably will explain an awful lot about that. 
So this is the groundwork video. We are going to go ahead and wrap this one up. We will be continuing into letter one next, and we will see exactly what unfolds by this knowledge. I am hoping that there is things that I can clarify. It says that he has some things and that they are veiled on purpose, and that is probably because he didn't want to be excommunicated from his church. The control system is very exacting in what it allows you to do and still remain with it. And so it is entirely possible that the reason he hid it was so that the church wouldn't find it. Right? We've seen evidences of that already in various studies. Some of the self-insertion can be traced back to that. Right? It is, I know this thing, how can I tie it to Christianity so that the church won't burn me at the stake? That is the very real fear, especially in this time period. This was in the height of the Inquisition, right? This was when they were actively seeking people to burn at the stake. So you would want to be rather circumspect in how you do things. That's why, in my estimation, we have secret societies, was to protect them from the church. The church was a destructive force in its entire history. <laughs> All it ever did was subdued by force. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, it was convert or die, and so people converted. That is a very real reality, and you don't have to like it. It is simply true. Hopefully, we can unpack and uncover the things which he has intentionally covered. Hopefully, y'all remember to remind me to look these various volumes up so that I can go back and remember and we can see, like, I will try, I really will, I'm going to try to remember this on my own. I'm just not good at that. I'm really not. It's like, oh, what's next? And then I go and search for something and I pull it completely out of my butt, right? This is me pulling it completely out of my butt. There was another study. I was like, maybe I'll do that one. And I was like, no, this looks interesting. And so I jumped on this. The same thing with the Melchizedek one. We are going to clearly define as much as possible the one true church the overarching what is real separated from the i have to hide that is my entire goal to lay out as clearly as possible the supernatural powers that you have access to i believe in magic if you haven't figured that out by now understand that I believe that he did too. Eckhart Hausen almost certainly practiced the same things that I do just from what I've read so far. Yes, there was some self-insertion. There was some couching. There was some hiding. He didn't have the same compunction that I do. Part of what I am is a destroyer of lies. I hate the hidden. <laughs> I understand the necessity of it back in the 1600s. I don't think we need that in 2024. I think that in large part the control systems are indeed holding us back from achieving the full potential of humanity. I believe that the things that I am teaching in these various playlists, the things that I expound upon, the things that I endeavor to show you that are possible, will lead us to personal illumination, but also to a collective goal I don't care if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Taoist or a Hindu or whatever. The control system doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me what name you place upon God. God is beyond names. It doesn't matter what gender you put upon it. It's beyond gender. All things are have both male and female, right? Masculine and feminine. Creative, penetrative force and absorptive grounding force that is Boaz and Jachin there is a reason why these things were couched there's a reason why they were hidden and I endeavor fully to cast light upon them I believe that we are at the point now where that is a necessity not just a want Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a series of somewhat difficult topics. I understand that I hold some unconventional beliefs and that I have a tendency to step on toes when I relay those beliefs. It is not intentional, but it is not something I apologize for. 
I could go and serve the control systems. That is something that if it was not for a moral objection, I could go and be quite prosperous at. I could be seeking the material wealth and it would come to me naturally because of the things that I know. That is not what I'm doing. I am trying to dispense information as freely as possible. Do I get paid by YouTube? Yes. Am I going to run ads on this? Yes. Will there be periods in time where I am doing self-promotion? Yes. Will I have books? Probably. Will I have schools and classes? Almost certainly. I am attempting to do something here. Money is a tool. I can use the tool without it using me. I find myself to be in a unique position of being able to do that. I ask to be an example of ethical capitalism because I believe that I can withstand the temptations that most people can't. There will be financial gain eventually, but what I do is not about the financial gain. I believe that I will be provided for, but I could care less. If I'm living underneath a tree and I die from starvation, then that's just what God willed. I don't think that's what he wills, but I will accept it if it is. This is about dispensing knowledge. Fully, completely, and just as plainly as I possibly can. And I don't know that I can say it a different way. If you like what I'm doing over here, let me know down below. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment if you agree or disagree. If there's something that you want to see. If it remains respectfully, it gets to remain up. And y'all please remind me of these things, please. If you really like what I'm doing over here, hit me with that super thanks because I am not a communist and I do not manifest money. And that is a hard place to be in if you want to eat. <laughs> to the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me. And I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Tape. Peace.